more extreme weather events are expected in the future. More extreme heat waves, storms, you name it. They're just expected to get more and more frequent. And we have to deal with that because every one of those is a challenge for, for agriculture going through. And we have to overcome all these challenges without utterly destroying the natural environment in the process. Agriculture is the single biggest impact humans have had on the planet. And it still consumes enormous amounts of water, fuel, energy, land, all sorts of resources. So trying to maintain the balance with this is hard. And I'm not claiming to have all the answers for that. Um, trying to actually achieve global food security requires a lot of work from a lot of different sectors. Um, and I'm not going to talk about all of these. We could be here all semester for that. My area where I approach this are these two. Crop improvement and then agroecology. And so that's what I'm going to focus on. And this is still a really big area, obviously. And so my slice in there is on these plant microbe interactions. So people have known for a long time that plants live with microbes in and around their environments and all over the place. They have microbes on their surface, inside their tissue, in the soil, everywhere. And it's known that these can impact plant performance. So they can impact when the plant flowers, uh, how it gets nutrients, um, resistance to pests, and even yield, supposedly. I'm, I'll be honest, I'm not super confident about the yield. Those clearly are not replicated very well. But the fact is we know that you can use specific microbes or mixes of microbes to influence all of these traits. And it's an area that we have not exploited very much historically. And so there's a lot of potential there. And so this is the area where I'm focusing. And some of the, some of the systems in here, looking at these plant microbiome, in, microbe interactions are very well studied. The best ones are the rhizobia, which are involved in nitrogen fixation legumes, and the mycorrhizae, which is a fung are fungi that make partnerships with most land plants. They exchange water and nutrients uh, from the, the fungus, help scavenge water and nutrients from the soil. The plant gives it carbohydrates and lipids and maybe a few other things. And so these are relatively well studied. We have a lot more that are not well studied. Um, and these are just some examples. So uh, there's an example of wheat where you can treat with a specific microbe and it acquires drought tolerance uh, and is better able to sound drought out. Uh, there's one, so my uh, department chair actually isolated a microbe that you can treat on rice and it reduces arsenic accumulation in the grain, even though the microbe itself is confined to the rhizosphere. It actually changes the chemistry around the rhizosphere to make arsenic be, be taken up less. And then one of my favorites is just recently, about two months ago, they published this study of nitrogen fixation by maize epiphytes. So bacteria that live in this little goopy mucilage stuff that's secreted from aerial roots and it fixed nitrogen that is taken up by the plant. And so these are all sorts of things that have potential. Now, it'll take a while to realize that. Um, and we're just at the very, very beginning stages. So I tell people, I say that we need three things to actually harness these. We need to know what the situation is now with the plants and microbes. We need to know what we want it to be. And we need to know how to go from here to there. And currently, we really don't know any of that. And so we're at the very, very basic <coughs> step of trying to figure out all of these processes and how they work together. And so what, let's start with just figuring out what's there, what communicates. So the plant microbiome, microbiome just means all the microorganisms that live on, in, and around a, some, an organism. And in plants, we usually divide this into three categories. So one compartment is the rhizosphere, which is what's all around the roots. Another is the phylosphere, which is all the aerial surfaces. And then you have the endosphere, which is what's inside the plant. Uh, and so these are the major uh, compartments that, that most people look at. And you can subdivide these into finer level ones, but these are the major ones. And so the major question in my lab is what shapes these microbiomes? So there's a lot of things that go into it. So you've got the plants themselves because they're the habitat. You have the microbes themselves because they're the things that are actually making these microbial communities. You also have the environment in the forms of light, heat, water, all sorts of stuff. And then you have interactions among all of these, which get very complicated very fast because everything is influencing everything else. The plants influence the microbes, the microbes communicate back to the plants. Both of them are influenced by the environment, and both of them have a limited ability to actually change the local environment. It's a very, very complicated system, which is part of the reason why it's 
we don't know many answers yet. And even trying to get this apart is too much for a single lab. What my lab focuses on is this, the plants and the environment, how they impact the microbial communities. And so I tell people, I actually treat the microbes as a phenotype. Um, they're a readout of the plant genetics. And I'm not saying that this is the one true way of viewing it. This is our approach towards this problem. This is our way of seeing the elephant, basically. And but we do this, we take microbial ecology and all sorts of other viewpoints, we will eventually, as a community, figure out how this actually works as a whole. So this is our particular viewpoint, where we're trying to figure out how the genetics of the plant alter these microbial communities. So I'm gonna walk through two projects here where we've been doing this. My primary organism is maize. It's the one plant that I've actually been taught how to grow, and so I stick with it. Um, we do have collaborations and other projects and a few other things, like the specialty project we're getting into, but this is the major one, and this is where I've done the most work. So this first project is when I came into uh, it was most of the project was actually carried out by these people. So this is uh, Ruth Lay, MA4, and Jason Piper, uh, who were at one point all at Cornell and are all no longer there right now. Uh, but this is a massive project. So in Maze, we have this mapping population called the Nested Association Mapping Population. It's 5,000 inbred lines that were developed as crosses among these 27 founders. Massive resource. And as such, these uh, these founder lines tend to be used for a lot of initial studies because they're very well characterized. Well, what these three did is they planted those plants out at five different locations in the U.S. The so three of them were up, were up close to uh, Cornell. Uh, those are the ones here in yellow. There we go. So these three were up close to Cornell, so they could sample those every week. These ones were sampled just up over, these ones in the Midwest were sampled during flowering time. And so they have 27 lines sampled every week throughout the season for those three. Um, when you added replicates and everything else, this is actually nearly 5,000 total samples of the maize rhizosphere developing over the course of the season on distinct phenotypes. This is a huge data set. And there's all sorts of fun stuff we can do with this. Look at the effect of the environment, look at the effect of plants, and see what's going on. And so we take all this data. I'm not going to go into detail about the, uh, the actual parsing of the data and doing that. We can talk more about that later. That's actually just kind of boring. Let's look at the results. So this is a representation of all 5,000 of those samples. So every one of these dots is a sample. Uh, this is the principal coordinate plot. Uh, if you haven't seen one of these before, the basic idea is it just collapses very complex information into an easy to digest plot. Essentially, dots that are closer together in this plot are more similar to each other than dots that are far apart. That's all it means. And so we've got all our 5,000 samples, and you can see they're colored here based on their location and also whether they're bulk soil or rhizosphere. And there's not many real patterns. I mean, you can see some things cluster up here, but the most of the colors are just scattered throughout. So from this, we can say that first off, there's no obvious pattern based on location. That, um, that was a little surprising uh, because usually location is one of the strongest drivers of this. Um, and it turns out that's true for the rare taxa. I'm not going to have the data up here to show. This, uh, this particular plot is biased towards the common taxa. And there doesn't seem to be many patterns there. The common stuff seems to be common everywhere. The rare stuff is what differentiates one location from another. However, if we change the colorization on this, we can see very easily that there is a major driver of these communities across all the locations, and that is time, the age of these samples. Now, because of the way this experiment was set up, we can't separate how much of this is due to the maturity of the plant versus this is just what happens over the course of the growing season. Although the fact that the soil samples all stay, uh, stay, stay located up here in the upper left, means it's probably it's partly related to the maturity of the plant as you go on. And so that's a major one, is that time is the single biggest driver. Now, where I came into this was trying to look at what is, is trying to get some finer division of what is controlling, uh, controlling the variability here. And the way I did this is by a trait called heritability. So like I said, I, I really care about the plant genetics. I want to see how much of this variation is controlled by the genetics of the plant. So we have 27 very diverse 
plants here, we should be able to see some patterns with that. So heresy <coughs> in this case does not mean that the, the bacteria are being transmitted through the seed. Uh, what it just means is how much of this variation can we tag to genetics, the part that is actually inherited versus the environment and other stuff which is not inherited. So how much is genetic? This is just the, the equation right here. Heritability is genetic variation over total. Um, and I can go into details if you want about how I fit this. Basically, I just used a statistical model, used these principal coordinates, and then used our data from every <laughs> to try to figure out what was the source of the variation. And so if you do that, we take our 5,000 samples and we fit our statistical models and we break it apart. And this looks a little complicated, don't worry, it's actually not that bad. So each one of these vertical plots is one of those principal coordinates. The first one always explains the most variance, and so it's the tallest, and then the next one, and the next one, and so on and so forth. And then I've color coded it based on the source of variation. So all the environmental sources are in orange. And you can see they make the biggest one. This tiny little sliver, which you can barely see, is the effect of uh, the genetics of genotype. Blue is the gene by environment interaction, the combination of the two of them. And then gray is everything else. That's the stuff we don't know what's causing. It's just the leftovers, the residuals. So first thing come out, out of this is that once again, environment is the biggest driver of these rise of food communities, and specifically time. That's this big chunk here in the middle of orange is the time that sample was taken, the age in weeks. And so age, uh, this time is the single biggest driver of these communities, very much environmentally driven. Second one is that genotype explains almost no variation. Uh, it is practically zero, which is very disappointing for a geneticist. <laughs> this is not the answer I wanted. Uh, I want everything to be due to genetics. However, that's not the end of the story because there's still a significant amount of genotype by environment interaction. And so what that this G by interaction is that it's not constant for a genotype wherever you put it. It depends on the local environment. So another way to put it, I say that you are you don't have these plants trying to coerce their local rhizosphere into the same community no matter where you plant them. That's not what happens. Instead, they take what they have there in the soil and then they run with it, but each genotype runs in a different direction. So for example, if you have an initial soil community here in Kentucky and you planted a bunch of plants, if you had like three different genotypes, they would end up with three different communities because they would go along their own different paths. If we plant another one down in Georgia, then it's a different initial community. They will again <coughs> run in three different directions, but they will not converge the same way here. They take what's there initially, and then it diverges from there based on the genetics of the plant. That's what that interaction means. Hmm. So. After looking at this for the overall community, I thought, well, well, maybe there's more than just the overall community. Maybe if we look at individual microbes, we might get a different, uh, different story. Because maybe there's only like one or two microbes that respond to the plants, and then the rest of them are just following this general trend. So uh, look at the heritability of individual microbes, which I've plotted right here. So an OTU, uh, Operational Taxonomic Unit, is kind of like a working definition of a bacterial species. It's really hard to define what a species is in this data. And so it's just a, it's an arbitrary kind of pathology. Um, and so I calculated the heritability for these. You can see the best ones here, their heritability is around 0.2 to 0.25. This is not particularly good. Yield is around 0.3, but it, it's also not particularly bad. And the question was, okay, is this significant? Can we get this by chance? Or is this something actually meaningful? And so to test that, I did 5,000 random permutations of the data, which showed that yes, some of them at least are significant. Uh, we got about 150 of these species that do actually seem to care about the plant genetics in a very significant way. Um, these ones here, you can see, these all have empirical p-values of zero. So, or at least less than one in 5,000. So they're very significant, even if they aren't particularly strong. Uh, and so there do seem to be some, some uh, significant repeatable effects of the plant genotype on these individual species. So take home from this is still, once again, environment is the biggest driver. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in the genetics, but we have to admit that the environment is much, much bigger. Uh, the plant genotype still has an effect, however, depending on whatever that initial environment is. 
and it does seem to affect individual bacteria in a modest but statistically significant way. And so that's the take home from this. There, there are some plant genetic effects, um, but you have to deal with the fact that whatever's there in the soil to begin with is going to determine almost all of what comes out. So let's move now then from the rhizosphere to the phylosphere. So this is the above ground surface, so specifically the leaves. Now the leaf community is a very, very different type of community than from the rhizosphere. So the rhizosphere tends to get most of the glory when you look at plant, uh, plant uh, microbiome work because it's very rich. There's thousands and thousands of species. It's very complex. Um, and it's just, it's like the tropical rainforest of the microbial world. It's an incredibly diverse community. Leaves, however, are basically the equivalent of microbial deserts. Um, the outside of the leaf especially has almost no nutrients, very little or no water. It's blasted by ultraviolet radiation, extremes of temperature. I mean, it's not a nice place to live. And so there's actually not that many things that live there, uh, which we'll see in just a moment. So it has very different environmental effects that are, that are in it. And the, this experiment was a different type of experiment. So the last one took a few genotypes and planted them at many different locations. This one was the opposite. It took many genotypes, about 300 different corn varieties, and planted them all in one location. Uh, this was done in conjunction with Carl Krenling, who was a graduate student at the time. Uh, he's now working for an R a startup in uh, Boston, I think. Uh, and the idea was, let's sample all of these plants and see what is growing on. He was doing it for expression analysis of the corn plant itself. I piggybacked on this project in order to get uh, the RNA of the bacteria living there. And so we took leaf samples shortly after flowering to try to sort of synchronize the, uh, the physiological development stage of all these plants. Uh, and then I looked at the ribosomal RNA of the bacteria to figure out who was growing there. Uh, importantly, this is ribosomal RNA, not DNA. So these are actually metabolically active bacteria. They are presumably actually alive and living on the plant, not just something that's moving on the way. So this is the maize leaf bacterium. So the bacteria going on the maize leaf. And again, this is another complicated looking plot, but let's break it down. It's actually not that bad. This is called a chrono plot, made by a program called Chrono. It's a nested pie chart. What you do is you start with the kingdom bacteria there in the center, and then each concentric circle is a one taxonomic step out, kingdom, phylum, class, order, species, genus, species, all the way down to individual OTUs on the outermost one. And I said how the leaf uh, community was not very complex, it's because if you break it down, most of it belongs in just two clades. There's this single monads, which make up about two thirds of the entire data set. Uh, the methylobacteria, which take up about half of what's left. And then everything else. The entire rest of the kingdom of bacteria lives in that little web right there. Not very much. Most of it is these two. Now, to put this in comparison, <coughs> this is a similar rhizosphere data from the previous study. Uh, and if we colorize this exactly the same, there's the methyl of bacteria in the same monad making that tiny little, almost invisible slice, and then everything else is filling most of it. So, like I said, very, very different community. More so, we can look at the core microbiome. There's a lot of talk about core microbiomes. There are different definitions of it. So I define the core as, the core as microbes that are present in at least 80% of the sample. Uh, so if we do that, we get 16 OTUs, only 16. Out of hundreds and hundreds that showed up in the sequencing data, there's only 16 that make up this core. And those 16 actually make up over 65% of the entire data set. In fact, most of those are all not even just 16 OTUs. It's like a single species with a few strains is what make up most of it. Very, very low diversity community. So, that's one of the take here. There's not many players. But then, who are driving it? What are the people who are actually driving the community structure? And not surprisingly, one of the biggest drivers is the methylobacteria. So this is, again, a principal coordinate plot. This is just two-dimensional. And these methylobacteria seem to be the major drivers. The sphingomonas, also a major one. Uh, it's actually number three, oddly. Uh, number two is a minor player, these bacteroidetes. Um, they there are only like one or two bacteroidetes that are part of these core OTUs. 
I was kind of surprised that they are driving the second principal coordinate, which means they explain the second most variation, but they're there. So apparently they just tend to have a very strong effect, even though they're minor players in the, uh, in the leaf microbiome. Now, one thing that recently my student, Lindsay Kobe, she took this data and started looking at disease resistance. Because this was something that came up previously. Some previous studies have shown that diversity in the leaf microbiome of maize was correlated with disease resistance, specifically against southern leaf blight here. Um, and so we took, we didn't score disease on these particular plants, that wasn't part of the experiment, but we did take publicly available reading values for these plants, because they've been studied previously. And we tried to correlate it with our community structure. Now, unfortunately, that didn't show anything. Um, I mean, we've done a number of crunching on this, but you can just see from the graph here, there's not really a correlation between our community layout and the disease resistance. So we looked at this for this community structure. We've looked at it in just basic raw diversity. If, you, if you're in this field, alpha and beta diversity, you look at both of them. Um, none of, neither of them really seems to correlate, which is a little disappointing. Uh, because this is something we were hoping to see again based on this preliminary, this previous data from other labs, but we had not seen in our data for whatever reason. So it may be that we had a wider genetic base from the plants. Um, it may be that we just didn't have a lot of uh, disease pressure that year, so it didn't exert whatever influence it may exert on the community, but in that probably we're not able to replicate. <coughs> so, uh, one question we had in this though is like, how representative are our samples? I mean, we weren't taking a whole form with them. You go to work with form, these homies are can get really, really big. We couldn't sample the entire thing. We actually just took a small little strip from the center of the uppermost leaf. And we want to see, okay, how repeatable is this? So the way we could we wanted to check this is through two different time points. I told you that the student working on this was using EQTL analysis, looking at expression. He wanted to see circadian rhythms, and so he we took samples at noon and at midnight. Now, and if you've ever wondered why so many horror movies involve cornfields in the middle of the night, <laughs> all you have to do is try to sample 300 of them for the leaf tissue out in the middle of the darkness with a headlamp on, trying not to spill the liquid nitrogen, and you suddenly realize why it's so scary. Yeah. It's because you hear the corn rustling all around you, you can't see anything, and people disappear if they walk more than five feet away from you. It's actually quite scary. Um, I'm glad I don't have to do that again. <laughs> so. But the good news of taking those samples is that for him, he got his expression analysis and circadian rhythms. For me, I got technical replicates. These, these communities should not change all that much in 12 hours. There's just not enough energy in them. And so we could look at these two samples and say, okay, how consistent is our sampling? If we took two samples from different parts of the leaves, do we get the same result out? And the general answer is yes, we do. So these are four plants that are all growing right next to each other. And these are their day and night samples. And I've colored the, these are the core OTUs, um, the ones, the 16 ones that show up across the independent sample. I've colored them consistently across here. And you can see that the day and night samples are relatively consistent among samples. So that was good. That meant that our samples are doing a decent job pulling them out. They're not perfect, but they're pretty good. Uh, what I was really excited about when I saw this, though, is that you see these plants were growing right next to each other in the field. Absolutely next to each other. And yet there's big variation from plant to plant to plant to plant. You can see there's a lot going on here. So this implies that there's a genetic effect going on. The plants are actually exerting an influence on their community. And then of course we had to actually go look at the control and have that entire hypothesis go into this. Because the control was our one plant, B73, that's the first reference genome. It was planted at multiple locations across the field. And you can see four of the locations right here. And you can see it has the same pattern, where it's got very good uh, repeatability from day to night. Um, and then from one plant to another to another, it looks no more similar than those other plants that are right next to each other in the field. And we've run the math on this, and it works out that basically there's no stronger correlation with the genotype here than there is to plants that are not related. Uh, and so this seems to be indicated not that it's a genetic effect going on, but it's a founder effect. There's, it's just a stochastic chance which happens, which organisms happen to get there first and establish a hold is different from this row of plants to that row of plants to that row of plants. Um, which is, again, not what I wanted. <laughs> but it is good to know um, that, that chance is playing a large role here in the establishment of these communities. They're not purely deterministic. However, 
we could still look, uh, look at uh, the heritability. We use a slightly different one here called narrow sense heritability. Uh, we don't need to get into details of what's different from the last one. They're, they both basically measure the proportion of genetic variation involved there. And so I did the same analysis, and out of a few hundred OTUs, I got five. Five that shows significant heritability. I've got flowering time up here in positive control, just to make sure the methods are working right. We know flowering time is highly heritable. And these OTUs are pretty good, not great. Um, and most of them are again methylobacteria. This is a recurring thing. These methylobacteria seem to be the ones that care about the genetics of the plant on the leaves. And we'll get to that more in a moment. So, but this brought up a question. Maybe we're looking at the wrong thing. So we're looking at the individual bacteria that are growing on the leaves. And we know from the previous data that that's probably stochastic. It's whatever happens to get there first. But maybe the plant isn't selecting at the level of individual bacteria. Maybe it's selecting to increase at the uh, level of function. And this is a hypothesis that's going around a lot because it seems to be getting a lot of support from many different areas where the fact that the functions that bacteria can fill are much more important than who they happen to be. So like you could have three different bacteria all capable of occupying the same niche on the leaf. Whichever one gets their first wins, and that's who you see. So if you're tracking the bacterial identity, then you could get three very different communities, but if you're looking at the function, these three would look very similar. And so we started to look at bacterial function. Now, we didn't have full metagenome data on these samples, but we could use this program called PyCross, which imputes the metagenome. This doesn't work as well in the rhizosphere because there's not that many sequence representatives in the rhizosphere just because of its huge diversity. Phylosphere is different. We actually get pretty good predictions based off the phylosphere because it's very low diversity, and most of them are actually pretty easily culturable. So we could compute what we thought the metagenome would look like in these samples, and then try to make some analyses. And so I ran the same heritability analysis with those. I ended up with about, let me see. Okay, I don't think I got any. I, we ended up with about 120 metabolic terms that were actually significantly heritable, so much, much higher amount. And then I took those, and put them into metabolic networks and looks for enrichment within that network. So we've got multiple layers of significance here, not just the things that are heritable, but that are heritable and enriched above what we would expect. And another complicated graph, this is the result. So these are those metabolic networks. Again, don't get lost in the details. This is just showing what happens when you stick these things into the metabolic network. We've got a whole bunch of stuff in metabolism here in blue. We've got some unclassified stuff out here. The most important thing, though, is that if we start looking at enrichment, only a small number of these really pop out as being highly significant. In fact, there's four. Out of the 122 individual terms, we get four terms that are consistently overabundant in the data. Two of them make a lot of sense. Methane metabolism and glyphosate and dicalbroxylate metabolism. This is short-chain carbon metabolism. The single monads and the methylbacteria, methylbacteria especially, are known to live off of these short chain carbon molecules leaking out of the leaves. And so this made a lot of sense. Uh, this, uh, this is actually what we would expect. And so we, we think that our analysis is working pretty well because we're getting this results out. Next one, secretion systems. Okay, so this could be a lot of things. This could be antibiotic secretion, it could be digestive enzymes, it could be communication, it could be secondary metabolites. It makes a lot of sense because all this stuff is presumably going on, but it's so vague a term, we can't really draw any conclusions from it. And this last one is the one that really, it's a puzzle. Nitrotoluene degradation. Arguably, this is the single strongest signal I have in this entire data set. It has a very high heritability of about 0.7. It is significantly enriched. It is the only term that is both significantly enriched and highly heritable on its own. And I have no idea what it's doing there. Um, Nitrotoluene is an artificial compound. My knowledge does not exist in nature. Um, and so why it has such a high genetic correlation, I don't know. I've got a few hypotheses right now. One is that there's some secondary metabolite the plants make that looks kind of like nitrotoluene. And so we're just picking up the signal from the proteins that are along in that pathway because they can also pass to this. Another is that there's maybe some component of lignin or some cuticular wax or something that's similar that this bacteria are breaking down with food or who knows what. And again, we're picking up the same protein. Basically, that there's something the plant does produce that looks kind of like this, 
that is what the actual signal is, and this is just what it's annotated as. So that's the hypothesis. No one has yet been able to tell me what is probably actually going on here. So if anyone here knows, please let me know. Because I've been trying, I've been asking this for nearly a year now, and no one has yet given me a been able to give me an answer to what's going on. So it's a bit of an enigma, but it's an interesting one. So uh, after getting all these traits, all the diversity traits, all the metabolism traits, the OTUs, what I really wanted was I wanted to find it plant genes that are controlling I want to actually narrow in, figure out how the plant is doing this. And so I performed a genome-wide association study. I'm sure you've all heard of these. Uh, this is sort of the bread and butter of my lab, actually, a quantitative geneticist. Trying to take these complex traits and identify the parts in the genome that are responsible for them. Um, I'm not going to go into the mathematical details. We can talk more about that later. Suffice to say, I again did the actual analysis, and then I did 100 random permutations to figure out what was actually believable. Now again, because this is not a standard analysis, we use flowering time as a positive control. It turned out very good. We got some good hits. Several of them are near known candidate genes. And so that looks good. We figured, okay, it's right. And then we moved on and did our microbiome traits and got very little left. <laughs> um, most of the microbiome traits showed at most one hit. That we could believe. Most of them actually showed none. Uh, and I think there were two that showed two <coughs> um, But there's one interesting thing that really came out of that. And that was this hit here. That <coughs> is hit by 21 traits, all of them that all hit that exact location. Now, these traits are highly correlated with each other, some of them are derived from each other. When we work that out, it ends up being between two and three actually independent traits. But still, it's a cluster of hits. There's multiple, some of them that which are truly independent, all hitting right there. So we wanted to figure out what's going on here. So this is the region of the genome where that got hit. Our hit is right here in the top and bright red. Uh, and then this around here is showing linkage disequilibrium, basically just showing how tight is our signal. A very tight signal should have a very tight peak. We have about as tight as you can get. It's, um, it's basically got nothing in LV with it. Uh, there's a, there is actually a second uh, SNP, but it's hidden by the dot because they're so close together. But otherwise, it's in completely linkage equilibrium. It's, there's nothing linked to it around. And if we zoom in, we can see that there's some genes around. If we zoom in even more, we find that this hit is a thousand base pairs upstream of that gene right there, which is exactly where we expect it to be if it was influencing that gene's regulation. This is actually the perfect spot to find a SNP, because it means that that SNP is probably changing the expression levels or expression patterns of that particular gene. And when we look at that gene, it is elongation factor one delta. This is a housekeeping gene. It's part of the ribosomal machinery involved in making <coughs> proteins. So this <coughs> is essential to life, and I have yet to figure out how on earth modifying its expression changes the bacterial elite community because it seems like modifying its expression would be a very bad thing and would probably cause all sorts of off-target other things going on in the plant. And yet, there's nothing else in the entire genome that is linked with this. This is right here. It's well assembled as far as I can tell in the genome. And so something is going on here. And so something this up, I mean, you've probably gathered here that we found some stuff. There's a lot of stochastic effects uh, the maze genotype does have an effect, especially on the mental bacteria. The function is important. But like all good scientific studies, we've raised a lot more questions than we answered. I mean, there's still a lot here. We haven't really figured out what's going on. And so, I mean, that's really the question. What do we do with this now? And there's a lot going on. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we don't understand. Uh, but the most important thing, from my point of view, is this. So, both the rhizosphere and the spilosphere, as I pointed out, are not actually that impacted by maize genetics. I mean, I focus on the genetics part because that's what I do. But in both of them, environment is far and away the largest single driver. Now, the thing is, from an objective point of view, I'm not sure this is a bad thing because breeding plants is long and time consuming and hard. And changing management is not, at least not as hard. So if these communities are actually impacted more by the environment, that means they're amenable to management. <coughs> We can just change how we treat our crops, how we plow, or what we spray on them, or whatever, 
and the communities would respond much, much faster. Whereas if they're actually determined by the plant kinetics, we'd actually have to breed for them, and that takes years and years and years. So this may not be a bad situation as far as agronomy is concerned, but you know, as a plant geneticist, I really want to study something that's affected by plant genetics. So what do you do at this point? You move to the atmosphere. <laughs> you go out to the other one, well, we have a test again. Now, there's a good reason for this. The endosphere made of all the organisms that actually live inside the plant tissue itself. Uh, these are presumably much more impacted by the plant than the things that are living out on its surface or in the soil. And so this is where we're moving now. We've actually collected a bunch of samples this past summer. Uh, the Fesky project that Rebecca mentioned is looking at endophytes as well. And so this is where I'm planning on going. Uh, I do not have data from this yet because we are still in the process of extracting all those samples. So come back to me in a year, uh, and I'll be happy to share where we're going with that. So I do need, of course, acknowledge all of the many collaborators who made this possible. These are big projects with lots of support. Um, my own lab uh, at Cornell and at USARS and all sorts of other places. Uh, funding sources who, of course, make all this possible. Uh, and you guys for listening to me. Uh, and I would say I would be remiss if I didn't advertise a little bit. If you know anyone who's looking for PhD programs in the plant sciences, Georgia has a very good plant sciences program, and we are actively recruiting people. So please pass the word along uh, if you know anyone who's looking. And thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions. Plenty of time for questions. Um, there's a, uh, I work in forages, but there's a lot of companies promoting products to spray on the plant, mm -hmm. um, humic acid solution, whatever. Do you know of any good studies that have looked at the potential beneficial effects, or do you just have to go with all the random claims that are made? Okay, so do I know of any good studies testing the, all these products to spray on, on fields and stuff, like biological specific yes, that's what yes, so uh, the short answer is no, I don't. Um, I have actually tested some myself. So last year I got four or five different biological products that are marketed for corn. I grew them out at five different locations across Georgia, right next to our statewide variety trials. Um, and they were research scale plots, so only about 70 plants or so. Um, and we didn't see anything. Uh, and you know, as I talk to other people, that seems to be the pattern that whenever an independent person tries to replicate this, they usually don't hold up. The one exception is like a rhizobia for legumes, but that one makes sense. Like if you, if you have a good rhizobia there, it will work better. Um, these other biologicals, I, I think there's stuff out there that should work, but I've never seen a good independent study. Yet. All of the stuff I've seen has been the company touting their own product, and I've never heard that. Unfortunately, no, not yet. That's what I suspected. It's good to hear some backup. <laughs> okay. Yes. Multi part question. Great book. Um, the first thing that I was thinking about the May study and your comment about genetics don't seem to have much to do with it, right? it's more environment. The first question is what other environmental variables beyond time did you measure? So, Okay. pH, I mean, were there, I guess there are other soil variables that were measured and correlated with that response, right? Okay, yeah, so question is, in regards to the rise of spirit, environment was the biggest driver, uh, what other stuff did we measure? So they did take uh, soil uh, measurements in terms of pH and um, uh, pH and nutrient distance, but I believe they only took those at the beginning of the season. I don't think they took those throughout the season. And so I wasn't able to actually correlate them with the development of the rise of spear communities over time. Um, I do have a project in, uh, that will be going in next year. So there's this big collaboration called Genomes to Fields, which is about 30 to 40 maize researchers growing up to 500 plants across the US. I actually have some money uh, that I just barely got from NSF where we will be taking uh, endophyte samples from at least 25 or 30 of those fields. And those ones have soil samples at the beginning of the year. They have weather stations monitoring heat and light and rainfall throughout the entire season. And so we're hoping to be able to pull some of those environmental variables and see how they interact with the plants. So just to follow up real quickly, the, I assume these plants are all grown under optimal conditions, right? They're nitrogen, phosphorus, 
They were all the three plots, the Cornell plot, that study. Yeah, okay, so conditions of the, the Cornell and Vaguna, yes, they were under basically optimal conditions. Uh, I believe one of them was an organic measurement and there were two conventional ones, but yes, they were not, in, not intentional stressful conditions or anything like that. So do you think then that, I mean, these are plants that have been bred. I mean, it's a nice uh, population that you're using, quite diverse. But I, I'm curious, they've been selected for, and do you think that under more stressful conditions that there would have been a larger expression of rhizosphere differentiation? Okay, so would there have been more expression, more community differences had there been some stress present? I don't know, uh, to be honest. Uh, I'm trying to think if I've run across anyone who's tested that. And I can't think of anything offhand of people comparing like stressed plant rhizosphere versus non stress. You'd have to find some way of differentiating the effect of the stress on the plant versus the stress in the soil. Like you want the community to change because the plant is stressed, not because you're stressing the soil community itself. Um, so I have, I have to think about how to go about designing that right. I mean, I think it's very interesting. It's certainly possible it could have a big effect. I just don't know what it would be. My thinking in that, and maybe the population that you've selected is sort of helps with this question, but you know, we've done, because you made the comment about um, it's easier to manipulate the management than it is to manipulate the plant genetics. But we've been breeding and, and selecting for corn varieties based on shoot specific traits for a long time, right? Since the synthase to now. So I feel like all maybe all of that selection that was done has narrowed the diversity of the rises here already because we selected for these high nitrogen, high phosphorus, great fertility soils. So have, do you think, in your opinion, have, have we bred out some functionality in the rhizosphere that is just sort of this mundane community that we have now? Okay, so have we managed to breed out over 10,000 years of improvement some, some function that would help create a beneficial rhizosphere community. I'm not sure someone has explicitly tested that. I would not be surprised to find that it got lost a little bit over time. Now, a lot of land races, the traditional varieties, are not grown under that great of nutrient conditions. And so they may have maintained it pretty well. Um, like the, the one I mentioned that has the nitrogen fixing epiphytes, they're grown under traditional uh, land race cultivation with like no supplemental nitrogen, which may be why that particular trait evolved that location. Um, so maybe in the past, maybe in the past really 100 years, when we really bred for really high performing, high input agriculture, maybe we've lost something at that point. Um, but I bet if we go back much further than that to more traditional varieties, they could probably maintain it pretty well. Do you think you get a bigger genetic influence from that nitrogen fixing um, community in the surround the states that they have found in your corn? I was kind of wondering um, something about that. Oh, bigger genetic influence on those nitrogen fixing epiphytes. Yeah, so I'm not sure. I actually really want to look into that. I made some crosses this past summer so we could start trying to dissect some of those traits. Um, I didn't know about that study per se. I heard some rumors about it, but I was really interested in that mucilage production because it's a way of influencing the rhizosphere community. Especially those particular ones just make so much of it, you can actually get a lot. Most may will actually make a little bit of it, uh, but those would just make much more and sort of easier to study. Um, I don't know, they found in that study that they didn't do a, a super in-depth uh, um, classification of the community, and they didn't have a lot of different genotypes, but if they grew the community in outside UC Davis and up in Madison, Wisconsin, they both got nitrogen-fixing organisms in there, and they both seemed to fix nitrogen, even though the communities were very different. And so it's, again, this case where it seems to be selecting for some sort of function over the actual individual organisms there. Um, I bet there's some genetic control over like the, the makeup of that mucilage and then obviously over the amount. Um, so there's something there. I don't know how much it is. Like if you're not sure fighting with one of those two, right? So uh, if you're getting the same hit, um, that, would be, that would be interesting. Question. Well, tell me a little bit about what an analysis is. So you take a sample and then you do this an analysis to get these graphs, charts. How, how complicated is one analysis? Is one analysis really 18 analyses or is there one analysis? How long does it take to do an so, analysis on a sample? 
Okay, so what is an analysis? How complex can they get? Well, it depends. So the basic of all of them is you have to get sequence data. So you take the sample, grind it up, extract the DNA, you make the library for it, and you send that off to sequence. And that's kind of constant. That's pretty standard. I mean, that's not a huge deal. The analysis afterwards can get complicated. So usually you run it through a program that will identify bacteria and will give you a table out of bacterial counts in a species. And that's the point at which it really branches off. So by getting those principal coordinate plots of one part of the analysis, that's relatively easy. That's kind of off the shelf. Basically, the more people have done it, the easier it is to run because there's off-the-shelf stuff. So that was easy. Bringing in my quantitative genetics part was the hard part because that's not a common analysis here. Most, there's a little bit of work like that in like human gut microbiome, but no one's really done much of it in plants. And so I had to make a bunch of my own scripts. And I guess, I mean, the short version is that by the time I was finished with that whole phylosphere stuff, I had about 100 different bioinformatics scripts that I was all coordinating together. So it can get very complicated. Um, so it, it depends on how far in you want to go. But the basic community level description stuff is pretty off the shelf and it's not that hard to do. So ironically, you know, we've been conducting the interviews for our IT specialists this week. And I asked Jason in my office, oh, so what kind of program? <laughs> and he said, Linux, Linux. Linux. And this is a word that has been brought up at all of our IT. <laughs> and I've had no idea what it's meant. Brian has been asking it. And I've been like, hmm, I wonder who uses that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's an all bioinformatics run on the which incidentally, any grad students here, you should learn how to use some bioinformatics stuff. You don't have to become a bioinformatician, but so much is data driven now. You should at least take a bioinformatics class before you finish. Take advantage of it um, because it will just make you so much more competitive in whatever job market you end up in. So please, please do that. You're safe. Yeah. Any other questions? Go ahead. I've already talked about it. So it was, it was neat seeing that the microbiome results were sort of replicable. Mm -hmm. Have you looked across years to see? Uh, yes and no. I, so the question is, it, uh, I've looked across years to see if the microbiome is replicatable. So the answer is yes and no. Yes, I have looked at it. No, I don't have data back yet. Those, act, those samples are actually, the DNA has been extracted, and we're just waiting to get the preliminary sequencing back to make sure that our, our uh, library prep is working right before we send the rest of them. I should have that analysis ready, I mean, hopefully within the next three or four months. Is that Phylosphere, right? That's Phylosphere. So yeah. one of the first projects I set up after I got to Georgia is we took that same population, about 300 maize lines, but we sampled them three times during the growing season over two years. Yeah. So that ended up with being about like 2,200 samples. Uh, so it was a lot of work. Uh, but hopefully it'll give us some really good data on how well it repeats, um, if, if they follow the same course year after, uh, you know, like in different years. Uh, and see if we can replicate the results from the previous one, which was taken in a big Do you think if you were working with perennial plants, you would see perhaps less of a, of a time? Do you think your selection for annual for an annual plant is influencing some degree that can make okay. So it's choosing an annual versus a perennial affecting the affecting uh, time. So uh, I think perennial plants are more stable overall than annual plants. <laughs> I think that's been shown in the literature. However, People have shown that over the course of the growing season, the perennial plant will change over time just because as uh, you get different environmental effects, so the plant may be stressed for water at one point, or maybe a bunch of nutrients at flowering time or whatever. And so it will still change, probably not as much, uh, simply because it has time to establish stuff. I have had one person tell me that, especially perennial rhizosphere, is first of all, much more influenced by the plant than the uh, than annual rhizosphere. Um, but it tends to be more stable. So maybe more genetic control. So maybe more genetic control with the with the perennial, yes. Um, it just takes much, much longer <laughs> to run those experiments. You're gonna get something good for your best work. Okay. Uh, <laughs> any other? I have a I have a few questions. So your data set about showing the stochasticity and sort of founders effects of these individuals showing up. Do you think any of that's coming from the seed? Do you so, think any of these things are seed, not seed transmitted? Per se, as I would talk about it, because it's kind of correlated, but on seed or yes. otherwise in seed. So seed effects, yes. So um, so is this what's in the seed affecting the stochasticity? And yes, that might be. We didn't control for seeds because that that the leaf one was originally designed for the RNA sequencing, uh, and then I piggyback on it to get bacterial stuff. So we didn't control for 
seed lots and uh, that stuff. Most of the seed there had been generated by the lab from that same field. So presumably it wasn't super heterogeneous, but I mean, there could always be some effects. Like if you get a sound effect on this plant, it gets transmitted, maybe it's just dusted on the seed or whatever. So it's certainly possible, yes, we haven't controlled for that. The rise of one night, I believe they actually did some surface sterilization uh, and made sure everything was playing the same seed lots grown in the same year to try to help control that. Any questions? No? All right, well, let's thank Jason.